Good evening, oh. everybody. Um, so Peter Drucker wrote about the modern business corporation and he had a really great quote. He said, the best way to predict, the best way to predict the future is to create it. I love this quote, especially as it relates to what we do as designers, because we don't sit passively waiting for the future. I'm excited to be hosting Eileen this evening. A couple of months ago, the administration from the college visited Steelcase and we met Eileen on that visit. We saw their workspaces, and we were also shocked to find out that Steelcase runs hundreds of tours a year through their facility. I think Len said 600, something like 600 tours a year through their office space, which we said that must be incredibly distracting to have 600 tours a year come through the space where you're working. And what was amazing was that they said it's a culture of sharing that they open up their spaces, they want people to come in, they invite people in, and they also do a really incredible job of hosting. Uh, their space is one of trying things and testing things. So I fell in love with this mentality, and I feel that our educational spaces should, be, should also be places of learning, testing, and sharing. Eileen Strickland McGee is a design researcher passionate about the ways in which the built environment shapes our experiences. As a member of the Workspace Futures group at Steelcase, she's part of a team that dives deeply, that dives into deeply understanding the ways that people live, work, and learn. The team includes architects, interior designers, psychologists, creative writers, and anthropologists, to name just a few of the disciplines. This is an exciting model of multidisciplinary practice, and I'd, I would argue it's the way that I expect many practices to be evolving and operating in the future. By asking big questions and explore, exploring complex answers, the Workspace Futures Group helps Steelcase envision possibilities and frame real-world choices for the present and future of living, working, and learning. For the last six years, Eileen has been focused on exploring these complex answers within the field of education and educational environments. It may not have been entirely fair this afternoon, but, well, Eileen was working this morning. She drove from Grand Rapids. She arrived here, and then we started pressing her with more and more questions about our own spaces, what our plans are for the, for the learning spaces within the college. So, She's already been working probably more than a full day today. Um, but, so we're really excited to have her here today. Uh, before Eileen spent her days envisioning the future of teaching and learning, she earned a Bachelor and Master's of Science in Interior Design with a focus on relationships between identity and school environments. She's an NCIDQ certified interior designer, design educator, and cross-country cycle leader. She's always spent her days asking the big questions. We're excited to hear about her work, and we, we appreciate her willingness to visit us and share her incredible experiences. So help me welcome Eileen this evening. Tonight, um, over the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to speak to you about the active agency that Built Environments has, with a specific focus um, and the importance of this in the context of education and education spaces. And so in order to heighten this awareness of its active agency that educational spaces have in shaping our social structures so that, me, so that we as designers and architects may continue to elevate the importance of thinking critically about the design and its effects, I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, structuration theory um, and, and why we're using that as a framework establish the concept of spatial agency, uh, discuss the relevance and importance of this in education, and then touch on what this means uh, for designers and architects. So the first one is um, why structuration theory? So the reason behind employing a sociological theory 
uh, as a framework to think about the active agency of, of learning spaces and the built environment is threefold. So first, uh, the theory applies systems thinking. And second, by using a sociological based theory over an architectural based one, uh, the origin of exploration remains very human centered. And third, education profoundly shapes our social systems. So, what is structuration theory? Um, it is a sociological theory that was proposed by a guy named Anthony Giddens uh, that basically says that the creation and reproduction of social systems is based on a dynamic interrelation between structure, which um, he defines as rules, regulations, laws, and agency, which he's defining as human action. So the theory posits that uh, an ongoing dynamic relationship, as shown by the circle going round and round, um, between structure and agency, each enable and constrain one another uh, to produce and reproduce the social systems in which we are embedded. Um, and it also proposes that we see the micro dimensions of our life and these larger macro dimensions of our life as mutually complementary. So effectively two sides of, of the same coin. Um, so to illustrate the sort of abstract theory in a little bit more of a concrete way, um, let's take the rules and regulations of Jim Crow laws, um, which were established back in the late, 19, or late 1800s um, that shaped human action. So for example, uh, one of the laws uh, in Georgia stated that any amateur black baseball team that could not play on a vacant lot or field that was within two blocks of a playground uh, for whites. So this rule that was put into place limited the agency or the human action of young blacks playing baseball in, their, in those neighborhoods. And so the human action was in accordance with the laws, um, which produced and reproduced the social systems of uh, race with, within that day. So, jumping back to the, the theory, so when we consider the built environment um, as it relates to the theory, the theory basically states that our experiences unfold spatially. So we are not divorced from space, we are a part of space. And spaces are active locales that influence and are influenced by the interactions of human agents, as shown here. Um, so whether it's intentional or unintentional, by being and behaving in a space, the individual and space are dynamically creating and producing um, this larger social system. So again, to illustrate this a little bit um, more again, if we jump back to this example, in the example of that Georgia law about amateur baseball games, people were behaving in a space in the physical neighborhoods, it was an urban space in, in this example, um, in accordance with what was laid out by the laws. But they were also doing this in other spaces as well, um, in accordance with other laws. So they were drinking from separate fountains, they were using separate bathrooms, they were sitting at the back of a bus. Um, yet, when people started to act differently and use and behave in those spaces differently, a different system actually started to emerge. So African Americans were sitting at the lunch counter. They were refusing to move from the front of the bus. They occupied the same classrooms as whites. And by acting differently in and within these physical spaces, they were dynamically creating and producing a different type of social system. And then what actually happened is that it started to change the rules and regulations um, and began to create new social systems around race in America. And this continues to this day, and there's a lot of different examples that you can think about um, and sort of and see this happening um, as societies evolve. So this concept of spatial agency or the, the, the uh, agency that space has um, to shape our social systems is really quite provoking. Um, and so when we think about this in the context of education, we ask what sort of systems are our current learning spaces creating and producing? 
um, whether we're aware of it or not. And then we ask ourselves, what type of systems does education want to enable now and in the future? And how can learning spaces create and support these type of systems? Um, and this idea that spaces have agency is, in the context of education, is not new. Um, but it's been somewhat limited to certain philosophies or approaches uh, in education. So early 20th century educators like John Dewey, Maria Montessori, who you see here, um, and um, Luis Malaguzzi of the Reggio Emilia approach, have all promoted the idea that learning spaces shape students' behavior and they shape their learning and development. And so in schools that are developed underneath and designed within these approaches, the learning spaces are intentionally designed to provide a multi-sensory experience, engaging the child's whole self in their learning process and supporting the school's philosophy and pedagogies. Children are able to learn and construct meaning within environments that support complex, varied, sustained, and changing relationships between people, the world of experience, ideas, and the many ways of expressing these ideas. And the practice within these early educational environments is an illustration of how learning spaces have active agency to dynamically create and produce the larger system that values community, autonomy, discovery, and so on. So, as we think about how the philosophies and pedagogies and approaches in mass education are, be are being currently rethought and redesigned um, to align with the future, as I mentioned earlier, the conception and the intention behind the built environment must evolve as well. So schools right now are beginning to em employ emerging pedagogies like collaborative learning, team-based learning, or problem-based learning, um, so that they can develop citizens that can engage in critical thinking, passionate inquiry, social collaboration, and creative innovation. And schools recognize that their pedagogies have to change in order to prepare students for the future um, and, and, and produce new systems. And so now they need to deeply consider the design of their learning environments and the ways that space can have agency over helping prepare the students and produce new systems of being. So from campus to, um, for, to the interior environments, um, all spaces express a set of values. Um, and the quote here of that schools are visible symbols of educational philosophies. So let's take a look at a couple examples. So the first one, which is not unlike this room that we're in. Um, uh, this is a more traditional, what we call traditional learning environment. In a traditional learning space, the physical design of the learning space is some version of the following. There's static, somewhat unmovable or very heavy desks, um, all in neat rows that tend to face forward at a board um, or a screen. And there's a large open space up front at one end of the room. Uh, there is usually one point of control for the technology, like this, um, within the space. And there's a very limited number of tools, such as markers or chalk or whatever it might be. And so when a learner enters this type of space, and they see the rows of chairs facing forward, it indicates to the learner that they are to enter this space, sit down, and passively learn or listen. The spatial design affords the behavior of sitting and listening, and you're confined to the chair in which you choose or are assigned. Uh, with one point of visual focus, a fixed front orientation, usually the inability to move the furniture unless you're given explicit permission to do so and break that rule, uh, no control over the tools of the space, and a lack of collective areas to gather, to collaborate, to discuss and create with peers. And so this is actually actively discouraged through the design of that environment. And in addition to affording the learner to assume certain behaviors and roles within that space, 
The space affords the educator to create and own the front of the room, thus signaling that they are the holders of the knowledge. And so the students follow the rules and roles of the listener while the teacher follows the rules and the roles of that sage on the stage. And it's a cyclical system creating and recreating itself through its interactions of space, human agency and action, and rules. And so if we unpack that a little bit, the traditional design of a learning space was developed in parallel with the societal need for mass schooling, uh, with rows of desks facing forward on a stage for the educator. Um, this becomes quite telling. And you can see by the pictures of, if you can tell which one's a factory and which one's a classroom. <laughs> Um, the introduction of this design layout immediately projects uh, specific ideas of power, production, behavior, and rules on how one should operate, which directly aligned with the industrial economy those students uh, are going to be expected to work within. It is the educator that holds the power and knowledge and tells the students what to know, when to know, and how to know it, just as a foreman on a floor may tell his or her employees what to produce, when to produce it, and how to produce it. These spatial designs call attention to the subtle ways that students might be internalizing these larger societal messages on power, knowledge acquisitions, and mode of operations just from their environment. And this industrial era factory line design for educational spaces stands in sharp opposition to the shift towards cross-disciplinary, integrated, active models for teaching, learning, and working. So, let's take a look at environments that are designed to support more of these emerging pedagogies and, um, and align with the needs of, of where the world is going. And so if we take personalized learning, which is an emerging ped pedagogical approach that is radically student-centered. So this is the definition that's um, put out there by uh, the U.S. Department of Ed, but it's basically the experience where the pace of learning are really optimized uh, for each individual learner, and that the standards and approaches um, and content are all based on learner needs, and that the learner is making that meaningful and relevant to them. It is driven by their interests and often self-initiated. So in the personalized learning space, um, and they look all very different, this is just one, um, the physical design of the learning space is some version of the following. There is a ver varied choice of settings and seatings for students to self-select based on their learning needs and goals for that day. There is a democratic collective ownership over this space, so nobody has a desk that is theirs that they go to maybe every single day but rather they pick and choose based on what their goals are for that day. Um, and there is an abundance of tools scattered throughout the environment for the students to choose from and use depending on what they need to accomplish. Uh, and when a learner enters this type of space, they see a variety of choice within the environment and expect that they might be able to explore, self-discover, and make meaning for themselves. And the spatial design affords the behavior of movement, engagement, collaboration, and curiosity. Uh, with multiple points of focus, it is up to the students to prioritize and determine where they need to focus their attention based on their goals. And the co-creation and feedback with peers is actively encouraged uh, with many tools for communication. So if we unpack this a little bit, like we did in the, with the traditional learning example, um, the design of personalized learning spaces actually mirrors the design of a lot of current workplaces. So the design layout immediately projects ideas of power, production, behavior, and rules on how one should operate, just like it did the last one. But there are different ideas of power, production, behavior, and rules um, that directly align with this more conceptual economy that these students, you guys, um, are going to be expected to work within. It is the learner that discovers power, knowledge, people, resources that they need to accomplish their goal, and they have some autonomy over the path they're going to take to get there. Um, and the teacher is more of the guide, and there is a resource for their learning. 
just as an employee has choice and flexibility in accomplishing a project, works with others to get it done, and the manager is there to help guide when needed. These spatial designs begin to call attention to the subtle ways that students are internalizing larger societal messages on power, knowledge acquisition, communication, collaboration, and modes of operation. But the, again, they are a very different message that is being internalized by these two different spatial models. And this conceptual era, uh, agile and collaborative and autonomy enabling design for educational sp spaces stands in sharp opposition to the design of traditional learning environments and what you see in a lot of schools today. So there's a little, a little more to think about too. Um, one thing that we have learned um, out of the many um, when we uh, are working at, Reese, uh, at Steelcase, um, and we're actually doing research around this now, is just because you build these spaces to support these different um, ways of, of being and operating within the world, um, will they come? So if you've seen the field of dreams, you build it and they will come. Uh, is that what these spaces are? What we found is because these are new environments, both symbolically and functionally, and they espouse new ways of human action, new rules and regulations, and in turn, new systems of operating and being in the world, as you might imagine, uh, these foundational paradigm shifts are pretty complex and come with a lot of challenges. And so this is really important for designers and architects to keep in mind um, because you're not just designing new spaces, you're actually designing new systems. And so when we are designing spaces that have active agency in creating new systems, we have to address the larger questions and issues of that paradigm shift. So how, how is a shifting culture being considered a part of the process? How are they thinking about change management being considered as they change their spaces? Because it isn't simply about putting a desk on wheels or putting some group tables in a space. It's about designers asking, what type of students are you seeking to develop? What is your strategic vision? What is your why? How are you getting there? And what does that start to look like? And space is just one important how. So what we found through our work at Steelcase is that addressing this process of change is key to helping schools successfully implement and adopt new environments. So we go into schools and we sometimes hear people say, well, the chair on the wheels, it's not working. And we ask, well, why isn't it working? And they say, oh, well, because the kids are moving all around and they're not focusing on me. And so it's saying, oh, OK. So it's not actually something that's mechanically wrong with the chair, but actually it's the expectations around it that are faulty. So that's where we have to start peeling back the onion and asking the questions. So again, when schools are seeking to move to a new strategic why, um, they aren't just changing their spaces, but they're actually changing their culture. And so um, working with schools and having them think through and asking the questions of them, how is this shift in your paradigm and your pedagogies impacting your people? How is it impacting their expectations, their mindsets, their behaviors, their relationships, their values? How is it impacting your processes, the procedures you have there, the protocols, the communications, the feedback loops? And how is it affecting your place? How is your space needing to change? How are your tools and technology needing to support this as well? And again, how does it align with your why? And so when we think about these multiple dimensions of change, uh, again, it's, it's quite complex. But you think about how are they addressing this at these different levels in the school, both at the school level and at the individual level. So at a school level, asking, how are schools preparing for this change? How are they defining change? How are they envisioning it? How are they planning for it? How are they piloting it and trying it out and learning and iterating? And then for the teachers that are in the school and the students that are in the school, how are their mindsets and expectations being addressed? How are they empowered to change themselves? How are they able to prototype and try it out? How are they personalizing the process and making meaning of the change for themselves? Um, and how do they know how to move forward? 
These are all really important questions to be asking. And so the implications for designers and architects, um, it extends just becoming extends beyond just becoming aware that space has agency, which is really important unto itself, but it's understanding the ways it has agency to create larger systems so that the design of these spaces um, aligns with the systems that we want to create. And then as you're doing that, um, it's also as a designer and architect taking on the role of not just designing the space, um, but playing different roles and addressing uh, the, the change, the fundamental change that's happening and helping clients and customers through that. And so the designer becomes an educator, a consultant, a guide, and a provocateur asking the questions. And so again, we ask, what type of systems does education want to enable in the future? And how can the learning spaces create and support these types of systems? And that's all I got. <laughs> so again, like I said, the question and answer time is usually a little bit more interesting because it's more of what you're interested about. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions about the content, but also if you have other questions, I can answer those too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, thanks for coming in, first of all. But you talked about the implications that the spatial agency has in learning in an office environment. And I know that the is already working on changing the medical environment as well. Um, what areas do you see this spatial agency really improving as well in the future, such as maybe governmental buildings to foster collaboration or something like that? I guess, what are you really excited about? Um, with this concept? Yeah, um, I mean, I think wherever you go, it doesn't matter what, I mean, space has agency over our actions. Um, and so uh, it can be your own home. <laughs> it can be anything. Um, and so I think that the, the larger question is, um, you know, how can we use space design? And as designers, what can be... Um, your ability to shape these larger systems just through the design of the space. Like I think back to that Jim Crow example, like what if designers only had designed like one bathroom or one water fountain? Like how might have that had people pause and act a little bit differently? Um, and so you see that again in the context of education um, when we design a classrooms or learning spaces a little bit differently and they don't have like forward facing, people walk in and they're like, well, where's the back of the room? Because you know, I want to be on my phone or something. Um, and they don't know what to do because it's all of a sudden asking them to do something different. And so I think that there are um, uh, a lot of realms that it's, this concept is really interesting in. Um, and for myself, I'm extremely passionate about education um, because I think it has a lot of ripple effect and, and um, impact on future generations, um, but you could take this idea and apply it in a lot of different ways and think about like how might you improve government just by the ways in which uh, their spaces are designed. Again, you need a lot of hows to do that, but <laughs> space can be one of them if we think more intentionally about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So maybe as I move up to the middle, I'll ask a question okay. too. I guess maybe I have a little bit of concern or for our students that are sitting here today yeah. because they've probably been educated in the spaces <laughs> like the spaces that you showed. Yeah. But the, the speed with which workplace is changing in relationship to education, they, I, thinking about say the continuum of a student that's educated in a, one of those new spaces and then moves into a workplace that's like that. Mm -hmm. Many of these students were probably educated in a traditional classroom, yeah. but by the time they make it to the workplace, the workplace has evolved and it doesn't have that analog relationship between the two. Right. So what happens? Yeah. Um, well, luckily humans are adaptive and responsive. <laughs> um, but I think that that's where you start to hear to like 
employers saying, you know, the, the um, students coming out don't have the skills that we need. And part of that is like the skills actually being taught and things like that. But when we think about the spaces, um, like in the personalized learning example, if you learn in those environments and you're asked in kindergarten um, to basically start making choices over what is your goal today? How are you going to spend your time? Um, what did you learn when you made that mistake? Versus you, it's 8.45, here's your math worksheet, you know, sit and learn. Um, obviously, the kids going through and practicing that for 12 years before they get to college or, or go out into the workforce are going to have those skills built up. That doesn't mean that um, if you've been in a traditional environment, you're not going to gain those skills. I mean, again, spatial agency is important, but I'm not going to say that it's you know the only thing that shapes humans. It's just a, a thing that shapes uh, our behaviors. And so I think that um, recognizing that when students start to work in those environments, even if they haven't been educated, you, they might have a steeper learning curve than somebody who's come up through that, but um, you can start to, to quickly figure out, like, what am I supposed to do here? And then, um, again, it just might take a little longer if you haven't been practicing time management for 18 years, and then all of a sudden you're asked to do it. Um, it just will, I think, it'll take a while longer. And everybody working now is like products of, <laughs> for the most part, traditional environments. I mean, I went, that was my experience as well. Um, so it doesn't mean that, you know, you're not going to have any skills, but it just is a steeper learning curve, perhaps. Yeah, I can, I can say if, um, no, it's for the video. Um, I, I can say that I was a product of the Wald Lake schools. It was very similar to that, just a little bit more robust. Mm -hmm. um, one of my questions, I have like six, but I'm going to pick from one of them. <laughs> Um, what advice would you give designers to create these spaces when budgets and ideas seem to be cut more from the educational system? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I've been to so many meetings through the Wald Lake schools asking, how can we change um, spaces? Because I took architecture classes in high school, and I was met with so many yes, but those seem to be more conversation yeah. stoppers instead of conversation yeah. starters. Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I'm trying to think of where to start because we also talk a lot about like having a yes and um, versus a yes but. Um, I think that there are, even if you had no money, there are things that you can do to improve, um, you know, like if you had a row by column classroom and you wanted to improve it but had no money, there are things that you can do to make that better. Um, and so I think part of it is, um, I mean, there's the whole dynamic of addressing sort of that mindset um, and are there different ways that you can engage with the people around the table that are making these decisions of like, let's think a little bit differently because people tend to sort of like approach problems the same way that they approach the problem before and the problem before and they've got these huge mental models built up around it. And so sometimes when you can introduce um, a new activity or different ways to think about it, and jar people a little bit out of their yes but. It's like even like, let's play this game, this design thinking exercise that we'll employ to, uh, you can't say yes but, we're not gonna worry about budget. Like what could we do? Um, and it'll come in and maybe employing some of those exercises when you're working uh, as, a, as a collective. Um, so that's kind of one answer. Um, the other one is that, um, again, I work for Steelcase, but like you don't need new stuff to make a difference. Um, you could clear out a space of heavy desks and put rugs and get couches off the side of the road. And <laughs> like, you might want to like spray them down, but, um, but you can create learning spaces. And teachers, like in education, teachers are doing this all the time. They are like really great bag borrowers and stealers, um, trying to create things um, both from their own pocket, but also things that are left over. And so I, I, um, creativity is not limited by how much money you have. Creativity is limited by someone's imagination to imagine something different. And so if you can help um, the people that you're working with imagine something a little bit different, 
um, and, and, and think about that first rather than like budget. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge, um, that's a win to celebrate if you can do that. I hope I kind of answered that. Yeah. Yeah, if you have <laughs> uh, I really liked your presentation. It's very Thanks. nice. Um, so when I saw this like idea of like challenging like how we book, um, go about designing our spaces and using them, um, I immediately saw the potential for something that I think is the most important thing is uh, mental health hmm. for just about everybody because like, have you considered how these spaces could improve people's mental health from even, like, people that are four, our age, and up to, like, people in their 80s who might yeah. have, like, Alzheimer's because there's, like, studies about um, music and how it can improve them. Could these spaces potentially do that for them or us yeah. and something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, you nailed it. And, and you asked the question before, again, what is this limited? It's not limited. Um, and that, to your point, is a... Um, area that needs a lot of help <laughs> um, in, in a lot of different ways. But um, again, from the power from which and the skill set that you guys are gaining now, what can you do um, as designers um, to help um, that little piece of the pie to make it better? I mean, that's how I feel about education. There's a lot of different ways to help affect and push education into more positive spaces. Um, and as a designer, like this is my one little way that I feel like I can make a difference. So doing that in the mental health field would be amazing. Hi. Uh, I've been uh, studying uh, spaces, uh, the relation between physical space and uh, the cognitive uh, health of an employee in a workspace. Mm -hmm. So my question is that we know that in on a typical workday, you can be uh, and you can be engaged at different cognitive levels of your work, which is, you know, for the four work modes, as you know. Mm -hmm. So how does one find a balance between privacy and collaboration in the workspace? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the way that, that we think about it and, and talk about it at Sealcase is um, it's not about designing like a perfect space that accommodates everybody, right? It's not a one size fits all, just like education is not a one size fits all. It's really about um, think zooming out and thinking about the whole palette of place. And so um, where uh, in a workplace um, do you have places that people can find respite when they need it? And again, do they have the agency to like use those spaces when they need it versus like you have to be at your desk from eight to 12 o'clock. Um, so that's where the rules and the whole thing comes back into play. Um, so again, I think that um, when you think about it, not as one individual space, but as a space overall, having that choice and variety so that when an employee is feeling, um, you know, I'm, I'm really productive right now, um, but I, I need to do that in a space away from my colleagues. They have those spaces that they can find and hide away. Um, or if they're feeling like um, I need to focus, and I do focus best when I'm around other people. Sit in the open cafe with, just like you might in a library here or a cafe here, putting earbuds in and working. Um, and not assuming too that like the, the, the ways in which I work are gonna be the same ways in which you work. And so again, to solve for that from a spatial perspective just by providing a lot of different choices for people to choose from and figure it out themselves what they need, um, that's going to be the best way. It's just the same thing with the uh, personalized learning environments. When you provide a range of settings to learners and they're like, okay, I have to accomplish this today. How am I going to get this done? They're actually using the environment to self-discover what they need and how they need to be supported. So the environment can actually be a tool of learning for themselves because they're like, I know I need to like lock myself in a room right now or I'm going to get too distracted. Does that kind of answer the question? So I'll ask one as I do this too. Okay. <laughs> so you said there's about, what, 20 people in your group at Steelcase? Yeah, in the Workspace Futures and group, it yeah. it includes psychologists and anthropologists. So. I think we're familiar with the type of work that we do. Like, okay, we, 
we design something, we draw something, we do it. Yeah. What does your work look like? Are you, is there, is it ethnographic yeah. in terms of methodology? And then there's also writers on your team. Is it, yeah. is it, how do you study the spaces that you're studying and how do you, what, what's the work that you guys do? Yeah. Um, I, I like don't, you guys are probably better drawers than I am at this point because I don't <laughs> draw a whole lot anymore um, in terms of what people traditionally think of as uh, interior designers. Um, uh, but my work is wholly focused on like the research portion and the, um, the concept development basically. Um, and so what we do is uh, we describe our work as we are finding the good problems to solve. Um, and so in order to do that, um, we start with a very user-centered mindset of saying, okay, we have a question around something and we're going to explore it. Um, and it might be a little bit more narrowed and specific question or it might be really broad and something that we just feel like we need to understand in order to move forward. And so um, we are primarily qualitative researchers, which is we do a ton of interviews, site visits, um, yeah, so a lot of ethnographic practice in that. Um, again, trying to find um, insights and, and, and an opportunity. And so everybody in our group, um, I would say, has uh, their strengths are that they are really good at finding, finding patterns and seeing things happening over here and being able to connect the dots. Um, they are systems thinkers. Um, so we definitely have a collective sort of um, skill set that we share, even if, some, even if everybody is a little bit different. Um, and so we will go through that process um, and look for good problems to solve. And, and what our research leads into can vary. So um, you know, it can lead into product, but not every solution to a problem that we see is going to be a product. Um, and so it might be just a new framework for thinking about something. It might um, go directly into, we do a lot even internally. It might affect our business strategy and saying, okay, this is how we have to shift. And we do a lot of that, especially, uh, especially nowadays. Um, and uh, it also helps go into, we have a whole group that does change management consulting. So what I touched on at the end of like helping schools, um, we do that for businesses, helping businesses think about what is the culture shift that they're going through. Um, so our research might inform that. So um, again, it just kind of depends on, on what our focus is, but, um, and, our, and our methods and practice might flex a little bit to, to fit that. Um, but we do a lot. And, then, and now we're starting to incorporate a lot more big data and qualitative, more qualitative research as well, um, because that's becoming really important. And that's a skill set that we have to build as researchers as well in order to um, move, into the, move into the future. So. Um, question. Uh, what, what role do materials play in your guys' qualitative research, whether you have an end product or not? Yeah. Um, so we have a, um, actually one of the colleagues on our team is a materials scientist. So we have a whole practice around exploring new materials. Um, and I can't speak too much of that because I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but um, this colleague works with our um, designers and, and engineers and sustainability team, and they explore the future of materials um, and, and, and then look at what that means for what we can produce, what's possible, um, whether that's more immediate or years in the future. So uh, materials is a whole sort of separate area um, that we're focusing, we focus on. Um, so does that kind of answer am I? Okay. So you, you mentioned that education is one of your main interests. And um, when Carl asked you about the other disciplines and you mentioned ethnographic uh, research methods, so a lot of gathering, I guess, first person accounts and, just, and, uh, and uh, interviews and things like that. Mm -hmm. So one thing I'm really curious about is you know, this current sense of crisis about um, attention spans and focus. And if your um, data collection has involved students of different ages, and are you seeing, I don't know, phenomenology or trends by interviewing 
uh, your subjects in terms of attitudes or actual behaviors that now stem from the use of devices that demand so much of our attention and kind of fragment our attention? Um, so uh, a few of my colleagues have been working on a more like um, technology focused project. So um, as it comes into education um, in, and some of the focus of our projects, it hasn't been directly on like the tension, um, but we do have a whole project that was looking at um, just the different ways in which people were using technology. Um, and uh, I think as a part of their work, they've started to uncover um, and touch on a little bit of that, of like the different ways in which people are bouncing between, um, and I wish I could remember the framework that they've just shared with us a couple months ago, but I can't. Um, uh, but the different ways in which people are, are using different technologies and some of that gets to like, they're bouncing between this of um, personal and professional and they're being blended. Some people keep that separate. Um, and how does that look over the course of a day? Um, are they you know, more regimented, like this is what I'm focused on now, or is it becoming more um, integrated and sort of bouncing around hour by hour, or five minutes by five minutes? And so they've done some research around that. Um, and so if you're interested, I'm more than happy to connect you with those colleagues who can dive a little bit more into that work. Um, yeah, so. I'm not sure this is a question, just an observation, but um, I just had my interior architecture students do an exercise where, as a way to learn about um, workstations and how to specify them, mm -hmm. we did that right up front first thing in class because we'll get the dry stuff out of the way <laughs> so they can be creative later. Yeah. So they had to pick from the top manufacturers a, and I gave them parameters, and. Um, specify all the components and the brackets and all that stuff. And then their part two of the assignment is to totally critique the open octopus, mm -hmm. or the open workstation, yep. um, the cubicle. Same parameters, but yep. they had to come up with their own materials, their own form, um, their own way. They still had to connect things to the form or partition or whatever, but it had to be their own creativity and how mm -hmm. they attach things and yep. how they move in the space. So it's just very interesting to see um, the different iterations that came out of that. You know, some uh, some of the forms are very organic. Some are still very precise. Some are very closed. Some are very open. Um, um, so I guess the question I guess the question I would ask is: Okay, so what? happens with that information. Okay, so one student used um, PVC tubes and stacked them up mm -hmm. and that, you know, at different lengths, which we've seen before, but they, um, it lets light in a certain way, whether the PVC is this long or that long. Um, another student used um, cork because it was, it's a sound absorptive material mm -hmm. and did sort of a folded project where the folding of the um, cork panels gave her some privacy, but still left mm -hmm. open area. Another one, you know, some wanted to create a really enclosed space, some wanted to create open. So you have, you know, a completely different variety based on their critique of that. So what happens, right. how do you deal with that information when there's so much difference? Like, obviously these are students, they're, mm -hmm. they're given the task of being creative and right. critiquing, but that's a lot, I mean, the range of um, variation in them is a lot to take in. And right. how do you deal with that when you're, I mean, obviously there's a lot more flexibility in furnishings these days um, right. than back, way back when it was terrible. So you mean as, as steel case, how, how might yeah, we, how do we qualify or? How do we, you know, how does anybody take that information and sure. use it and take it forward? So I think, I mean, or steel case, uh, because all of the things that we design and develop are research-based, there's usually a pretty strong focus on what are we solving for. So as I said earlier, part of um, my job is to find 
like what are the good problems to solve. And so as a company, we're not going to invest in producing a product unless it's, we feel like it's solving for something that needs to be solved for. And so as a part of that, that might help sort of a little bit filter like what are the types of things that might work. And in terms of um, certain ways of articulating that, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of the designers on staff, right? They probably have a lot of interesting debates that uh, we're, not, we're not privy to. Um, but again, focusing on why are we doing this? And then, of course, you know, what do we have to consider as a business? Like, you know, if one thing is super expensive, we're probably not going to do it because there's all those considerations. Um, and then, of course, there's just the aesthetic choices that, that our designers are involved in. Like, and that's their job is to explore those. So I think how that how those decision gets made, it's not just in one point in time, but it's a series of these, why are we doing this? What considerations do we have? And who's working on this? And, and how are they um, debating that within themselves? Thank you so much. Uh, my question has to do, I think, from the, of the client perspective. Mm -hmm. So you showed a very appealing Montessori classroom yeah. as sort of the student choice yeah. option. Yeah. And I'm thinking more of the high school plus mm -hmm. um, situation where you've got initiatives like No Child Left Behind, where you yeah. have teachers, a lot of pressure points, more and more uh, um, things being added to curricula, yeah. uh, more students in a classroom. And if you're dealing with clients who are trying to address all of these other pressures in addition to these changing or the desire, I guess, to yeah. change the pedagogy yeah. to embrace these new technologies. Do you, I'd love to hear what you yeah. thought about that. Um, so, uh, well, I'll speak directly to it. So we just did a big project around personalized learning. Um, and, and we visited schools that were public, private, charter, um, had, um, you know, not a lot of money, a lot of money, built it from scratch, are in a 100-year-old building. And so, one, that these things are possible, uh, kind of back to your point, like these things are possible if the people are able to imagine that they are possible. And so a good example of this is uh, we visited a school in the Chicago public school system, um, you know, which has a reputation of being a huge city public school system. Um, and there was a elementary school there that was in a 100-year-old building. So they had gorgeous old hallways, but you know, hallways with just classroom, classroom, classroom. They had, I think it was like 35 to one. So like they were overcrowded classrooms. Um, and the leader of that school, the principal of that school was, uh, he was a great leader because he had a vision and he recognized that he needed to also work with the faculty to help bring them along and that you can't do that too fast. And so, um, and then they were employing um, a, a nonprofit called Leap Innovations who works with schools to help them change their culture as well as the technology and space, et cetera. Um, and so in that case, um, I think one, it takes uh, good leadership to be able to set that vision. And then also he intentionally sought to pick the right teachers to help start build on success. So doing that top down, bottom up approach. Um, and they didn't have a lot of money. And so uh, before they even started thinking about what new stuff they were gonna put into these spaces, they repurposed the things that they had. And they bought a couple things, like they bought some bean bags from Walmart, I think. Um, and uh, what they did was they then, in these classrooms, set up these different zones because they realized that, um, you know, we have, to, we have to have, we have 35 students. And so they can't all just be in this space at once. We actually have to have them working out in the hall if we, need, if we want to give them space. And so they put the bean bags out in the hall, which was a huge step for this teacher. They were like, but I can't see them all the time. And so they had to really address this whole issue of like control and it's okay and learning to trust the students, uh, which is a whole other thing that I'm, I'm more than happy to chat about. 
Um, but, but basically what they did is they created different zones and they used time, because time is a resource, to say in the morning, this is what they're working on for two hours. And the kids started to know like, okay, I'm at this station for 40 minutes and I'm gonna be working on this. And they had a little bit of choice. It maybe wasn't as much as the picture, but they had a little bit. And so, um, and again, not a lot of money to do that. And so I always use that example because it's like, if this 100 year old building in the Chicago public school system with not a lot of money is doing this, um, anybody can do it. Um, and so again, I think it just takes thinking about it as that whole system shift and, and, and those different parts that I showed, the people and the process and the place, how are they thinking about each of those? Um, and again, having a yes and mindset, not a we can't do that because we have no money mindset. So I've got a question for you. I'm interested in, like you pointed out, the different learning environments and the difference from a, <clears throat> a flexible learning environment or like a singular focused learning environment. And I think there's uh, arguably times where you need to have both in a space. Mm -hmm. So what role mobility or flexibility of actual furniture systems plays into that role? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I think when people say they want flexible learning environments, they have to define what they mean by flexible. And what is going to flex? Is it the furniture? Is it the people? Is it the um, content or the activities that they're doing? And so um, we, we interviewed a school uh, once that they like wrote a grant and they had, and this was not one of our grant winners, so I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. It was a different <laughs> school. But they, they, they um, said, okay, we want flexible learning environments. And it was three teachers that were going to share this space. Um, and they got in there, and they all had very different reactions to it. Like the English teacher loved it, the math teacher hated it, and the history teacher was like somewhere in between. Um, and as we were interviewing them, um, asked them, like, well, what sort of discussions did you have about what flexibility means to you? And they're like, we didn't talk about it at all. We just put it in and assumed that everyone had the same definition that we did. Well, there's, you know, there's a red flag of like why it's important to have these conversations before you make big decisions. Um, so I think like that's something that when people are considering um, and, and even when they come into Steelcase of like doing, is this the right solution for us? We're not saying that like, you know, you put a verb classroom or a node classroom or this is gonna be the solution for you. It's much more about again, what are you trying to do and what does it mean to you or the teachers and the students that are gonna be in that um, to be flexible? And that's where, again, these conversations become really, really important uh, so that when it goes in, there's not these misaligned expectations and, and, and sort of anger around, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Um, but then the positive of that, if it does go in and people are a little angry, uh, if you give it time, <laughs> Um, people tend to adjust. And so uh, with the teachers that we interviewed, as I mentioned, we interviewed them, I think it was like in October or September. So they had like just gotten it. And that's where the, their emotions were a bit heightened. And then we came back in April and every teacher had, had moved. They're like, it's nice because now this is our new way of being or our new way of teaching. And even the math teacher who was, had, had put tape on the floor and been like, can you put all of the chairs on this piece of tape uh, when they're like meant to move, um, had, had, it was like, I took the tape off the floor. And that was like a big step for her. So kudos, you know, like <laughs> she didn't have to be, you know, doing personalized learning, but that was a step for her. So, um, so yeah. So when you're talking about these kinds of environments, especially like the Chicago School District, for example, do you see a major decline in disciplinary issues, uh, especially from like the teacher's point of view, having students in the hallway, like you said before? And sort of like also how do students interact when they go through the hallway just during like passing time? Because it sounds like both those sort of environments are changing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and actually the schools that we um, interviewed uh, as a part of this personalized learning, who were moving towards these ways of giving students a lot more autonomy and choice, 
did see a decline in behavioral issues. And so even the principal at that school, he's like, I'm able to walk you around today because I don't have to be dealing with things in the office. And I think that goes back to um, the, the idea of the systems that are being created, even within those schools, in the, in a, in the microcosm of a school, of that when, when they were starting to have an environment and that was meant to develop and build community and trust, um, that's what started to happen. <laughs> and so, like with that beanbag example, you know, they put them out in the hall, and at first it was hard, but the teacher luckily had some awareness that she was going to take that step back. Um, and over time, the students learned, they had that space, that they were able to make a choice. Am I going to be on task, or am I not going to be on task? And if they were not on task, it wasn't like go to the principal's office. It was, let's have a conversation about, you know, about that. Um, and then if they are, they start to gain the trust of, of the teacher or of their peers. And so what we started to see is that they were actually then allowing the students to move further down the space away from them. So they had some like, like bleacher type things that they had set up at the end of the hall. And all of a sudden, like, without maybe always having it be very conscious, they had built up trust in their students that they're like, yeah, go down there. And the students themselves, once they were felt like they could be trusted and the teacher saying, yeah, go down there, I trust you, um, they started to act differently. And so uh, we heard that a lot from the schools that we interviewed uh, as a part of this project that um, once they started knowing the learners, and they started focusing on relationship building um, and, and granting some freedom so that, so that uh, students could earn that trust. Um, it started empowering the learners to take control and take more responsibility over their teaching and learning. And so when, when they look at terms of things in terms of growth, they saw growth in traditional metrics like test scores and reading scores. Um, but they also saw growth in terms of these more intangible ways of like, they became more accountable. Um, their goals actually were becoming more real to them. So um, it's the, the, the intention behind the design of the spaces um, was, was starting to play out um, in the system that they wanted to, to be creating, the culture that they wanted to create. I wanted to thank you again for tonight. I mean, it's, you have such great examples of human-centered design and the relationship between the agency that's possible with what's happening in design. So thank you so much for yeah. coming tonight. Of course. Thanks for having me.